Okay, so once again, welcome to GS215. Uh, it is pre-anatomy and physiology. Uh, it is a continuation of what you had over the summer. Um, GS182, that was the biology course. Um, so that focused more on things like cellular biology, um, genetics. Uh, and at the very end of that course, you started learning something about um, the human bodies the anatomical terms, for example, the types of tissue, uh, and that kind of serve as a, a bridge to our current course, which is again, pre-anatomy and physiology. So in this course, we will be learning the different body systems, uh, starting with the cardiovascular system today. Okay, so my name is Vincent Wong. Uh, you can just call me Vincent, uh, and you probably have received an email from me uh, earlier, maybe like last, later, late, late last week, I think that's, that's when I send it on, maybe around Thursday, I don't remember exactly. Uh, if you register after that, you might not have received that email, uh, but that's okay. I'll be, um, you know, uh, basically going through the expectations with you today. Uh, and um, that's basically the information that you would have gotten uh, from the email anyways. Okay, so let's get um, started. Now, if you have any question uh, uh, at all during the, um, the tutorial, you can uh, just type it in the chat box. Uh, and sometimes you know, it looks like I'm, I'm looking away from the camera. Uh, I'm not being distracted. I'm just looking at my other screen. That's where your chat stuff are. So you know, if you have a question, you can type it there. Feel free to unmute yourself at any time. Um, if you want to directly ask the question, that is OK uh, as well. Uh, I'm pretty laid back person, so there is no need to be too formal. Um, just, you know, speak up um, if, you, um, if, you, if you need anything at all. So before we begin with the actual uh, tutorial, I just want to go through some of the basic um, uh, uh, information about the course, uh, where you can get resources, if you need uh, extra help, uh, how do you contact me, and, and, you know, where do you get the lecture and stuff like that. Now, I'm not sure um, what the format was exactly over the summer. I think most of you might have um, uh, uh, Genevieve as your teacher, um, but, but uh, this course structure might be a little bit different than what you were used to. Um, so I'm going to explain it right now. On your timetable, you will see there are two slots uh, for this class. Okay? If I remember correctly, you have a Monday slot uh, and then you have a Wednesday slot. Uh, and, and the classes will be 8.30 to 11.20, okay? So rather than meeting twice a week live, like what we're doing right now, okay? So what we're doing right now, it's called synchronous learning. That means we all come together at a specific time uh, and, and you know, you're gonna see me as a live person, okay? So rather than doing this twice a week, we only do this once a week. And that typically happens on the Wednesday. The Monday slot, uh, the Monday 8.30 to 11.20, that is reserved for what we call asynchronous learning, okay? So asynchronous learning means that you will do the learning on your own, okay? So when I sent out the email last, uh, last week, uh, I told you, right, before coming to the tutorial, you should uh, uh, download and print the uh, study guide and then the PowerPoint slides, and then you should watch the lecture one recordings, Okay, so if you click on the lecture one recordings, it will take you to the link, but I'll show you how to get there without me providing a hyperlink. Okay, so what you can do is you go to the course homepage, you go to content, and uh, there are three units in the course. Each unit has four lectures. I'll explain more about that later. And if you click on unit one, you will see lecture one, two, three, and four. So in lecture one, which is cardiovascular system, you will see the learning objectives here. And then what you want to know, what you want to do is you want to download the PowerPoint slide here, right? Preferably you will print it, right? Just like you would at school, right? Or if you have like a, like a tablet or something to write on, because you want to be taking notes while you watch the lecture recording, okay? And then you will click on uh, these recordings, okay? So this recording will take you uh, to the YouTube link and you can watch it on your phone. You can watch it, you know, uh, anytime. Um, that you want. Okay, so the, the, the idea is uh, we block off Monday morning session, three hours for you. That's for you to 
to do all these things, okay? Uh, I understand some of you have work, you might have kids that you need to take to school and, you know, other, um, other uh, commitments. So, you know, feel free to watch these at any time, really, okay? But I do want you to watch them before coming to the tutorial. The tutorial is not a substitute for the recordings. The, 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 the recordings is like the whole movie, right? Okay, these lectures is like the whole movie. What I'm doing at the tutorial, it's like a, it's like a, a, a recap. Okay, so if you if you come to the recap without looking at the whole thing, you might get a little bit confused. But you know, sometimes I get it. Sometimes you know, there are too much work, and you might fall behind a little bit. Um, uh, and and if you haven't watched it, still you should come to the tutorial. Now, having said that, let me just do a quick poll. I I, I want to see uh, uh, how many of you uh, have actually watched the recording uh, before coming to, to to today's class. Okay. So if you have watched it, please choose A. Uh, if you have not watched it, please choose B. No judgment here. I just want to know, okay? And, and the polls are anonymous, so I, do, I, I would not know who select what, okay? Okay, that's uh, reasonable, I guess. Um, as you can see, we, we have about half, half, um, there are a few people who haven't answered, but that's okay. So, uh, fantastic. If you have watched it, uh, if not, then I urge you to do it after class. Um, you might have a little bit of trouble following some of the concepts I'm going through in the tutorial and that's okay. You can feel free to ask questions as well, uh, but moving forward, uh, please try to watch them, um, before you come. Okay. So the lengths vary. Okay. Sometimes they are like, you know, I try to keep it under a half an hour per, per, per segment, uh, but, uh, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, so any questions so far about what you have to do each week, right? So again, you do your asynchronous stuff on Monday, and then you come to the tutorial on Wednesday. Now, there are a few exceptions, okay? And I'm going to talk about that right now, okay? If you go on the useful resources, useful resources, uh, you will see a bunch of stuff, okay? So first, you will see the tutorial recording, okay? So uh, let's click on that and see what will happen. Then it will take you to this document. So that, that's our Zoom link, right? Uh, with the passcode. I don't think you have to enter a password, actually, but if you did, that's what it would be. And right now, there is nothing, okay? So after today's class, what I will do is I will post the recording of this session on this document. Okay, so if you ever need to go back uh, to a previous recording or if you missed it, then you just come back to this page and all the uh, recordings for the tutorial will be here. Okay, the recordings for the lecture is on the eCentennial page, right, that we uh, visited before. So just to show you how do we get here again, the table of contents, uh, you want to go to useful resources uh, and then the tutorial recordings. Okay, so again, there's nothing right now, but there will be after class. Um, there's the course outline that tells you, um, you know, what's going on with the course. Uh, you know, there are 84 hours, so on and so forth. Um, so this, um, don't, I mean, read through it if you want, but um, uh, keep a copy uh, for yourself. Because uh, when you go to another college later or something for some other program, and you need to show your credentials, uh, or if you need exemption from a course, um, this is the document that you will provide for them, okay? Now, this tells you about the evaluations, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, it tells you about the topics and, and all the stuff um, that it, you will learn in the, in the, in the course. So go, go through them, uh, but don't, don't pay too much attention about when the quiz and the, and, the, and the tests are happening on this document because we are not going to be following exactly um, to this document, okay? To know when the tests and quizzes uh, are happening, again, go back to useful resources and you want to click on the weekly schedule, okay? So all of you should download a copy of the weekly schedule, okay? Now, if you have trouble going to these places, you can always go back to the course homepage I created some quick links here. You can click on them, click on the weekly schedule here, the pink button. It will also take you uh, to this document, okay? So this is a calendar that you should all download 
and uh, I don't know, pin it on your fridge or something. Um, so here, right, this week is week one, and then Labor Day was closed, right? Um, so hopefully you have watched some of the lecture recordings, and then we are, we are here right now, okay? Now, it says the tutorial is 8.30 to 11.20. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to go like the full three hours usually, okay? Uh, typically, it's just going to be like two, um, one hour, and then we take a short break, and then we have another hour, um, and then sometimes we go additional uh, five, ten minutes over, but usually that's it, okay? Uh, we rarely go beyond uh, two hours and 15 minutes, okay? And then the, the remaining time, uh, if you have questions, you can stay behind and ask. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we definitely are going to be done at around 10.45, I would say, okay? With one break in between. So you can see most of the synchronous uh, ha uh, uh, sessions happens on a, on a Wednesday. Uh, there are some exceptions, and I'll remind you when those exceptions occur. For example, in week number five, uh, that's when you're going to have your test one. So instead of having the, having the test on Monday and then another class on Wednesday, what I'll do is I will, I will have the tutorial on Monday to help you review, and then we will have to test on Wednesday. Okay, so there are some uh, exceptions, but generally speaking, we will have the synchronous sessions on the Wednesday. Uh, does anybody have any question uh, so far? Just gonna give you a second to ask. Um, will your lessons and everything be directed right towards the workbook? Um, can, does that make sense? Do you mind clarifying that a little bit? What do you mean directed towards? Um, like, are you gonna be going in line with the workbook? Yes, so the workbook uh, is, is your study guide, basically. So a lot of information in the, in the lecture recordings, uh, how should you study for the test, right? Okay, so the, the, the questions on the test are based on the, the, the workbook uh, material. Those are the ones that you should focus on, uh, as well as everything I cover in the tutorial. Okay, so if there are extra things that you read online or in the textbook, you won't be responsible um, for them, okay? Um, talking about the workbook, though, uh, how many of you have purchased a copy from the bookstore? Again, let's just uh, do a quick poll. I, I just want to, I just want to see. Um, sorry, they changed the interface uh, on the, um, on the Zoom. So I have to find the buttons. Okay, there we go. All right, so if you purchase the hard copy of the workbook, please choose A. If you have not, please choose B. Oh, you guys are so quick with the poll. I love it. Previous classes are usually a little bit slow on that. Okay, so uh, yeah, only a few of you have purchased the workbook, uh, which is fine. Okay, uh, I, I will give you the digital copy. Uh, and, and, you know, for people who don't have the printer uh, or they like the convenience of just having like the um, like the entire workbook like that, uh, so that you know they could they could work through it, they could color on it. Uh, you have the option of purchasing it, and there is a link in the um, in the homepage here that will take you to it. Okay, so uh, th there it is. you just click on it, and it's like thirty six dollars twenty five cents. I don't think there is a shipping cost. Um, double check with the bookstore, uh, but uh, but you do have that option. Okay, uh, and and we will be using the workbook quite a lot throughout the entire course. Okay, so there is that. Now, in terms of uh, evaluation, what's going to be happening with the evaluation is that, uh, let me start an empty page. So like I said, there are going to be um, 12 lessons uh, separated into three units. Okay, so basically unit one, we are going to have a quiz. Okay, and the quiz is going to be 10% uh, and it will uh, 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 be covering material for lecture one. And then you will have a you will have a test. Test is going to be twenty percent, and that's going to be lecture two to four. Okay, you will also have a lab quiz. I will explain more later. That's two point five percent, and that's the entire unit. Okay, uh, 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 so basically, it's it's not going to be cumulative in that when you finish the quiz, then the test you don't have to worry about lecture one anymore. Okay. And then when you go to lecture two, it's basically the same format. You will have another quiz, okay, which again is 10%, but this time it will be only on lecture five. And then the test, 20% will be on lecture six to lecture eight. And then you will have a lab quiz again, which would be 
and that's lecture five to lecture eight. Okay, and the same thing for unit three, with one exception. In unit three, the lab quiz is worth 5% instead of 2.5% uh, because it's there are a lot more materials to cover in, in, in that unit, okay? So the course is broken down into little bite-sized pieces. Um, so hopefully you won't feel too overwhelmed. Um, any question about the structure and the breakdown of the evaluations? Now, in terms of when the evaluations are gonna be happening, you will once again go back to the weekly schedule and you can see the uh, first quiz is going to be on th uh, week number three. Uh, and the quiz is going to be done online, obviously. Uh, and, and it's going to be available from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and um, you can just log in during that time and, 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 and do it. Uh, if you are registered with uh, CALS uh, and require special accommodation, please email me and I will um, you know, extend the time uh, for you, but typically speaking, a quiz would be 40 minutes uh, uh, and a test would be about uh, 70, 70 minutes uh, long. And all these information I will post on eCentennial um, along with the number of questions and all that uh, right before the quiz uh, is going to, to occur. Uh, Colleen asked, would there be any group work? There is no group work in, uh, in this course. Um, so either that's fortunate for you or, or unfortunate, depending on what kind of person uh, you are. Some students prefer group work, others um, don't, but we do not. We do not have any group works. Um, going back to the evaluations, the quizzes are going to be, uh, have a typical multiple choice questions. Uh, so one, one, one correct answer. Uh, and then there will be um, multi-select questions, questions there where there are multiple correct answers and you have to choose all of them, all the correct ones. Uh, and then there will also be application questions, uh, which requires uh, a little bit of thinking, uh, um, and, you know, taking what you've learned in the course and applying in a, in a case study environment uh, and, then, and then, you know, finding the answers for that. Uh, we will be doing practice uh, questions throughout the tutorial. Uh, so I, I will show you some application questions to prep you. Um, don't, don't get too worried, okay? Uh, typically the first quiz, everybody does quite well, okay? Um, I will prep you very well to help you feel confident. Uh, and then the difficulty would slowly increase um, as we progress throughout the course, okay? So the first quiz is again week three. Uh, and then you will see uh, for the lab quiz, um, uh, uh, the lab quiz are only 2.5% and you have, two days to do it. It will be available uh, on, um, on uh, the Monday, for example, and then it will be due the next day, okay? So the window is a little bit longer. Um, so how do you do the lab quiz? Let's go back to the homepage here and under content, under content, you will see the lab here, okay? So I believe you have access to all three of the labs already. So you can just click on it. And it's basically a PowerPoint presentation uh, with questions on it, right? So if we were doing this in actual class, face-to-face, uh, -face, we, we would have models set up around the, the classroom and then you will be holding them and then you'll be you know, completing a worksheet, okay? But we cannot do that now. So we just have a picture of it is not, really the same thing, but it's the best thing we could do, right? So then, you know, uh, there's A here. So on your, you, you can print this out or on your computer, you will write down A and then you will label it. Can anybody tell me what A is? Uh, anybody who uh, knows the answer for A over here? Anybody know what A is called? No, okay, yeah, so, um, Colleen said a order, that would be the correct answer, right? And if you didn't know that, that's okay, right? You, you, you watch the recording, you come to the tutorial and hopefully you will know the answer later and then you will write it all down and then you will do it for, for all the slides, okay? So later on, you will have blood typing stuff and then uh, lungs. So you would print this out or you do it on your computer, but the key thing is you would do all of these. You do not, do not have to submit this. This is for you only. It's not worth any marks. So after you've completed this, then you will do the lab quiz. 
So here is an example of the lab quiz. Okay, so question seven here. Um, there's a blue arrow pointing to the model, and then it says which part of the conduction system is located in the indicator structure. Okay, so you know you might not know the answer right now, and that's okay. After you do the lab, you probably will know what the answer is. Okay, so doing the lab is going to help you do the lab quiz. Okay, don't don't do the lab quiz cold turkey. Okay, don't just do it without studying, right? Uh, because you won't be able to get a good score, okay? Um, the lab is a little bit, the lab quiz is a little bit uh, more lenient compared to the quiz and the test. You will have two attempts, two attempts. So if you if you flung the first one, you can do it again, okay? Uh, and only the best score will count, okay? Um, just a couple more things and then we we're gonna get started, okay? If you go to uh, content again, content, uh, unit one, lecture one, there are study resources, study resources, okay? So that's the study guide that you want to download and attempt before coming to class, okay? I just realized uh, the one I posted earlier was, uh, was an older version, so I updated it. Um, so the, you might see a few minor subtle differences um, with what I have and what you downloaded. That's okay. You can download the latest, latest copy later on. There are some crosswords you can do. Um, there's a cell quiz that you can do to study. Okay? Cell quiz is very short, like eight questions, 10 questions, and you can do them as many times as you, as you like. Okay? It's just a way to self-assess to see you know, how much you know. Video resources. So if you click on that, it will take you to a page that looks like this. These are just a bunch of videos that I pull off the internet um, that are related to the unit that we're doing, okay? Related to the, uh, the topic that we're doing, okay? So here are a bunch of videos related to the heart, the circulatory system. Uh, there are some <clears throat> uh, uh, YouTube courses uh, that talks about the cardiovascular system. So if you wanna hear it from a different perspective, you can watch those uh, as well. Keep in mind, all these extra resources, you're not responsible for the test, okay? If you hear something that we did not cover in these videos, I will not be testing you uh, on it, okay? So make uh, use of these, uh, it's quite good. Uh, and, and then, um, yeah, there are some coloring sheets uh, if, you, if you want. Uh, coloring is an excellent way of, of learning anatomy, okay? Um, 3D models, that's also very good, okay? Um, I only have two here right now, but you can click on them. Let's see if it will open. Yep, so you can pull it around, you can zoom in, you can drag it around. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just good because we don't have a physical model like we would in class, right? So, it's, you know, the virtual thing is the, is the next best thing. So you can... Click, click around, drag it around, and look at it from a different perspective. So for example, here you can see the tricuspid valve has three flaps. That's why it's called tricuspid. Tri means three, right? Like tricycle, three wheels. Tricuspid, three flaps. And here is the bicuspid valve. Um, and, and, you know, looking at these models, I feel, is a good way to help you study as well. And finally, uh, textbook. People usually ask me about textbook. Um, there are no textbook. You don't have to buy it but I do have a link to an online textbook, a free one, okay? So you can click on it and uh, it will take you to the online textbook um, and, and you can read about the stuff, okay? Uh, only if you need like extra information, right? Um, I, I think that the lecture recordings should be sufficient and the tutorial, but if you need extra things, um, they are available for you. Okay, so that was a lot of information uh, related to the course. Um, any, any questions before I move on to the actual tutorial? You guys all with me? Excellent. So let's get started. Uh, let me see. Um, sir, I have a quick question. Sure. So the study guide that's available in the bookstore is the study guide that you will be posting. Yes, it's just some people don't like to print themselves or they don't have a printer, right? So they have the option of purchasing it. That's all. Okay. And when did you um, upload um, the updated study guide? Because I printed it out. I just wanted to know if 
I printed yeah, out. Yeah, I just mm. did it like uh, five minutes before class. Sorry, I, I only oh. realized it then. But it's not a big difference. It's just like extra charts and stuff like that. Um, it's it's not gonna. You don't have to reprint it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, I I will do this. Uh, with the assumption that you have watched the recordings, uh, but I understand it's the first class and a lot of you have not. So I will, you know, go into a little bit more detail um, than I normally would. Okay. So stop me if you have any question. Okay? It's important to ask question. Okay. I, I, I want this to be a little bit interactive, um, but uh, I, I know people sometimes don't feel comfortable asking questions, um, but do try. So here, Name some major blood vessels that supplies different organs. Okay, so to the head, we have the carotid artery. Carotid artery. Okay, so the carotid artery just kind of runs up the neck, right? Like you can put, put your uh, two fingers here and you can feel the pulse of the carotid artery. Okay, and then that would take oxygenated blood to the head, right? which supplies oxygen to your brain, really. And then coming back down, we have the jugular, the jugular vein. Next, we have the uh, lungs. So that is the pulmonary, pulmonary artery. Okay. Anytime you hear the word pulmonary, you know it has something to do with the lungs. Okay, pulmonary uh, uh, artery. And then coming back, we have the pulmonary, pulmonary veins. Okay, perhaps I should not color code these because um, the oxygen content is not always um, is not always matching the color. Okay, for example, the pulmonary artery is actually oxygen poor compared to the um, you know car carotid artery. So I'm just gonna stick with black here. Uh, the heart, the heart. Uh, the heart cannot use the uh, blood within its own chambers because the blood is going through at very high speed and very high pressure as such is going to rely on a separate network of arteries to obtain nutrients and oxygen. That is the coronary, coronary artery. And then we have the corresponding coronary veins. The kidney is important for filtering your blood to remove toxins and waste product to create urine. Uh, and to supply the kidneys with blood, we use a renal artery and the renal veins. And so the renal artery actually branches off from the aorta while the renal veins are going to join with the inferior vena cava. Liver also detoxifies your blood and we have the hepatic, hepatic artery and the hepatic veins. Okay. Moving on. If we were to trace a single drop of blood to see what kind of structure it passes through, okay, we would start, I mean, you can really start anywhere because it's a circuit, uh, but typically most textbooks would start at the um, superior and inferior vena cava. From there, it is going to go into the right atrium. Okay, and I'm using blue uh, to do the, um, to do the uh, oxygen pour. And so blue is oxygen poor. Okay, it doesn't mean it has no oxygen in it. It's just very low, okay? Uh, from there, it is going to go through one of the four valves. Uh, I'm going to use pink, right? Or let's use orange. That is going to be the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve, okay? Uh, and it is... It is part of the AV valve. Okay, so you have two AV valves. Okay. From the tricuspid valve, we are going to go to the 
right ventricle. Okay, so below the right atrium is the right ventricle. And uh, when the right ventricle squeezes, it will push the butt through an other valve. This is the pulmonary, pulmonary valve. And pulmonary valve belongs to another pair called the semilunar, semilunar valve. And that's going to take the blood into the pulmonary, pulmonary artery. And then at the lungs, it will get reoxygenated. And then once it gets reoxygenated, we will say O2 rich. And it will go back to the heart through the pulmonary veins. Okay. And it's going to return to the heart on the left side, in the left atrium. From the left atrium, it will go through the other AV valve. This one has two flaps as opposed to three. We call it the bicuspid, bicuspid valve. Okay. Sometimes you will see people uh, write mitral valve instead. It is the same thing. Okay. Bicuspid and mitral valve are the same thing. After passing through the valve, it will go into the left ventricle okay. and then it will pump the blood throughout the body um, but first it must go through the aortic valve which is another semilunar valve uh, and then it will go to the aorta and then it will go through the body right. so if you want you can put like you know body and then after the body it will go back to the vena cava okay so singular is vena cava, plural is vena cava. Any questions so far? Fantastic. Next one, circle either artery or vein that match each of the following description. First one, higher blood pressure. Generally speaking, the closer you are to the heart, the higher the pressure, right? Think of the heart as like your um, water faucet, right? If you connect it to the holes, the closer you are to the water faucet, the, um, the, uh, the higher the pressure. So uh, artery would be the correct answer here. Okay, higher pressure. It is because the artery has high pressure that's because th th that's why you need to have a thicker wall to uh, withstand that pressure. Okay, so between artery and veins, the artery would have the thicker vessel wall. Um, again, to to hold, maintain the integrity right against the high blood pressure. Right? If the if the wall is thin and the pressure is high, then it's very likely to rupture, right? and we don't want that. Larger lumen diameter. What is lumen? Okay. Lumen just means the inside of a hollow structure. So if you think about a, a blood vessel like this, okay, this is the um, this is the vessel. Maybe maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, this is the inside, right? That that is the lumen. Okay, so like uh, I got a roll of tissue paper here, right? So this is the blood vessel. This is the inside. That's where the blood is. This here, lumen. Okay, um, the word lumen will come up again and again. It's just the inside of a hollow structure. So the lumen of the stomach, that's where the food goes, right? Okay, the lumen. So which one has a larger lumen diameter? Okay, so that, that would be small lumen diameter. This would be like bigger lumen diameter. Okay, so generally speaking, the veins. The veins has a larger lumen diameter, okay, because it has a thinner wall. Okay, so arteries are thick, but then the uh, lumen is small, but then for veins, it's thinner, but then the lumen is bigger. Contains valves, okay? Which one contains valve? Okay. The veins do, okay? The valves are there to prevent the backflow of blood, okay? Because the pressure is so low in the veins, they don't really, the blood don't move too quickly. 
So sometimes they go backwards, especially in the legs. So you want to have these, you know, valves um, that would that would catch the blood that are falling behind, um, going backwards. Blood has higher velocity. So generally speaking, artery has higher velocity uh, and carries blood away from the heart. Okay, A for away. A for away. Okay. So an example of a multi-select question. Yeah, a multi-select question is a question that has multiple correct answers. Okay, so you will have some of those on the, uh, on the test. Um, an example of that would be uh, select all of the following description that match an artery. Okay, and then I would, I would put a bunch of these and then you have to check the ones that applies to arteries. Okay, so not super hard. Uh, but again, you have to study for it, right? And uh, get some colors. You, you need a lot of colors for this, uh, for this course, okay? Like this might seem very like baby stuff and you don't really need to have colors. But later on, when we go to the nervous system or something, like we're going to be coloring the brains, okay? Uh, let me see if I have a brain picture here to show you. Yeah, we're going to be coloring stuff like this stuff like this okay and all of this you'll be doing while you watch the recording right so you're going to need a lot of crayons okay they're on sale at walmart because it's uh back to school okay i just got a bunch for my for my daughters um so you know go get some if you don't have any colors okay label the chambers of the heart use blue and red to indicate oxygen level okay so here remember we are looking at it from an anterior view okay anterior view which means we are looking at it from the front. That's why the right side on the paper, the right side on the paper is actually the left side of the heart, okay? So unless otherwise indicated, the diagrams are almost always anterior view. So here we have the right atria, okay? Right atria, okay? And that is the uh, wrong color, I'm sorry, <laughs> it should be blue, right atria okay so that is again for oxygen poor okay we are collecting the blood from the vena cavi that's why they are oxygen poor it's going to go into the right ventricle on the other side we have the left atrium and the left ventricle Uh, in terms of contractions, the atria, okay, A-T-R-I-A, that is the plural for atrium. The atria contract together, and then the ventricles contract, right? So it's like squeeze, squeeze, okay? Simultaneously, the top two squeezes, and then the bottom two squeeze. Okay? And the red, of course, it is oxygen rich. Label the structures leading to and away from the heart. Basically, these are the vessels. Okay, so we have the superior, superior vena cava that collects oxygen poor blood from the upper parts of the body. Okay, so if you think about like a person like this, okay, the heart is about uh, uh, here. Okay, so all the oxygen poor blood from above, from above. That's going to go back to the heart through the superior vena cava, okay? And then uh, the rest of it, these ones, that would go back to the body through the inferior vena cava, which is down here. Okay, in the flow chart above, I showed you that both of the uh, superior and inferior vena cava would pour the blood into the right atrium, Okay. Uh, over here, we have the aorta, aorta. As you can see, the aorta branches into three smaller vessels. One will go to the right side of the body, to, to the right arm. One goes to the left arm. This one's going to go up to the head, and it will branch into the carotid artery that we talked about before. Um, now, if you, can, if you can rotate this mentally in your head, you will be able to see that this aorta actually arch back, and then it will come down like this. Okay, so uh, uh, it's going to go through the uh, diaphragm 
and then once it's in the abdominal cavity, once it's in the abdominal cavity, it will split. It will split into left and right. Okay, so this one, I'm, I'm just going just gonna to label it for you because we will see this again. This is the abdominal, abdominal aorta. Okay, do you understand what I mean? Like if you can see through, right? Like the aorta is going to go all the way down from behind the heart, right? Okay, like so. Uh, I mentioned this earlier today. Can anybody tell me what this is? What are they branching into? What are they branching into? Hey, I'll draw more pictures to help you, to help you see. Not to scale, obviously. Um, but uh, what would that be? Anybody? A renal artery. Thank you. That is the renal artery. Very good. Renal artery. Okay. Again, this is not to scale. Okay. Your, your kidneys are not smaller than the heart. Okay. Very good. Uh, a couple other things here. We have the um, pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery. Okay. Um, there is a misconception. People think artery is always rich in oxygen. Not true. Not all of them. For example, the pulmonary artery is actually oxygen poor. That is why you are taking the blood to the, to the lungs to get reoxygenated. So there is the one on the left, there is the one on the right. Okay. And then it will come back from the lungs uh, through the pulmonary, pulmonary veins. Okay. And then the, here is another one, pulmonary vein. Okay. So these are, these are from the lungs and these are to the lungs. Okay. Any question at all? Great. Label the four valves of the heart. We did that in the, in the little flow chart above, but let's do it again. Uh, I, I, I think I used orange earlier. So here, that is the tricuspid valve. This is probably not the best diagram I'm going to admit uh, for showing valves, but uh, it comes with the other ones uh, that we label. So there is a tricuspid valve, and then there is the, is the bicuspid, bicuspid valve. Okay, so um, the way I remember it is just the number 32. Okay, 32. If you look at the heart from the front, is 32. That's the number three and two. Tricuspid, bicuspid, okay, 32. And then, um, again, these are the atrioventricular valves or AV valves. Uh, over here, we have, we have the pulmonary, pulmonary valve, uh, and we have the aortic valve. These belong to a set known as the Sami Luna Vow. Okay, so a couple of uh, uh, you know information to help you refresh your memory about the valves. The AV valves, the tricuspid and bicuspid, they open and close this together in synchrony. Okay, so when the tricuspid open, the bicuspid will be open as well, and then when the tricuspid close the bicuspid will also close, okay? Same story for the semilunar valves, okay? So the pulmonary and the aortic valve will open and close at the same time. However, when the AVs are open, the semilunar will be closed and vice versa. So if it's the same color, they would be in sync with each other, but then out of sync with the other color, okay? So whenever the oranges are open, the green will be closed. Whenever the oranges are, um, are closed, then the greens will be open. Okay. Uh, and, and so what are the function of the valves? The function of the valves is to, the valves, right, is to prevent, prevent backflow of blood. Okay. So the tricuspid will close when the right H uh, ventricle contracts. So the blood will only go forward and not backwards. That is why when the tricuspid close, the uh, pulmonary valve will open so that 
it will be able to go through, so that the blood will be able to go through. Okay. Next one, uh, trace the flow. Okay, so we've done this a couple of times already. Do you have sorry, a question, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I apologize. Do you mind no going back to page five? I just missed something really yep. quickly. Sure, there you go. Okay, perfect, thank you. No problem. I'm done. Okay, uh, so this is the flow. We have the vena cava coming in, into the uh, right atrium, through the valve, into the right ventricle. And then it's gonna go through the pulmonary valve and like that, okay? So again, this is going to the lungs, okay? To the left lung and then to the right lung to left lung, and here we're gonna go to the right lung, right lung. Okay, again, left and right, it's um, opposite because you're looking at it from the front. And then it's gonna come back, it's gonna come back from the lung, from left lung, and then I don't have space to write it, but you can write it, this is from right lung. Uh, and then it's gonna go down here, the left ventricle is going to squeeze and then it's going to go through the aortic valve like this to the left arm, to the right arm, to the head. And like I said before, it's also going to go down to the abdomen. Okay. You want to know the flow uh, quite well. Okay. Practice writing it out a couple of times. Okay. I hope you're all still with me. Uh, let's do some polls. Okay. So here are some um, sample questions that you might see from the um, quiz that will happen in week three. So go ahead. Try it out. Okay, I'm gonna give another 15 seconds. Um, hi, sir. Mm -hmm. What are we trying out? Oh, the question, the question right here. The question is on the screen. And then, uh, do you, are you able to see the poll? I'm not really. Are you using the phone or the desktop? And desktop. Uh, that's okay. You can just do the question like uh, on your own and then, you know, uh, we'll take it up in, in a bit. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the poll doesn't show up for some reason. Uh, but I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. Can you guys see the results? Can you just give me a thumbs up if you're able to see the results? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. So here, right? Um, the left atrium receives blood from... Uh, to do this question, you can just go back to here, our flow chart. Uh, give me a second. There is the flow chart uh, and the left atrium, right? left atrium here. So all you have to do is look at what is before the left atrium and you can see it's the pulmonary veins. So over here, the correct answer is the pulmonary veins. Okay. And most of you got that right, which is good. And if you didn't know that, that's okay. Now you know where to look for the answers. So there could be any number of variations of this question, right? On the test, it may be the right atrium receives blood from, right? Or the left ventricle, so on and so forth, right? That's why you need to know the flow, okay? Um, practice writing it out. Uh, I know sometimes people have this um, 
you know, uh, sense of safety that they have their notes uh, next to them and they could always just look it up. Uh, but try not to, you know, rely too much on that. It's okay to have your notes. I'm not saying not to have your notes. It's an online environment. I understand you're going to have your notes uh, or even Google or whatever. Right? Fine. It doesn't really matter. But, but you, should, you should still study a little bit, okay? Otherwise, you won't be able to find the answers quick enough, okay? All right. Select all the correct statement below. So this is an example of a multi-select question, right? Multi-select question. So you have to choose all the correct answers. Uh, and again, if you do not have, you're not, not able to see the poll, that's fine. Just do it on a piece of paper. For those of you who joined a little bit late today, uh, the recording for the, the tutorial will be posted on eCentennial afterwards. So you, you didn't miss anything. Okay, this one takes a little bit longer, maybe another half a minute or so. Okay, only six of you have tried it. What about the rest of you? Are you guys still um, trying to figure it out or sh should I wait a little longer? Okay, uh, not sure, uh, but I I'll stop it now, okay? Uh, because it has been two minutes, uh, but do try to partic participate a little bit, okay? Uh, even when you're not sure, you can still try it out. So. Uh, let me share the results. Okay. So all the correct statement, let's read them all. First one, the bicuspid valve divides the right atrium from the right ventricle. Is that correct or not? Okay, so let's, let's uh, draw the heart out, okay? So this is the heart. This is the, uh, the right side, the right side. This is the left side. And remember, I said 32, right? That's a number to remember. So that means this is the tricuspid valve. And this is the bicuspid valve, which means the first statement is incorrect because on the right side, this should be the tricuspid valve. Okay, so do not choose that one. And nobody did on the poll, which is great. Next one. Aortic and pulmonary valve prevents the backflow of blood into the atria. Is that correct or not? Okay, so what you want to do is you can go back to this one and you can see the aortic valve, right? Before the aortic valve, it's the ventricle, okay? And before the pulmonary valve, it is another ventricle, which means the function of the, aort uh, of the, um, of the um, uh, semilunar valves is to prevent backflow into the ventricle, not the atria, okay? Um, the one that prevents the backflow into the atria, that would be the tricuspid and the bicuspid. Do you guys understand? Okay. Look, right? The tricuspid, right? You all, the, the valves always prevent backflow to the thing that is before it, okay? Immediately before it. And so immediately before the tricuspid valve is the right atrium, right? So these, the bicuspid and tricuspid would prevent backflow into the atria, whereas the semilunar would prevent backflow 
into the ventricles. So the second one is also incorrect. Next one. Uh, the tri uh, tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. That's the correct one. So you should choose that one. The AV valves prevent backflow of blood into the atria during ventricular contraction. I just explained to you that is exactly what they do. Uh, and so that is the correct answer as well. Okay. Um, the multi select question, these ones on the test, on the quiz and test, uh, they are worth two points each. So you can get a maximum of two points. The exact way that it's calculated, it's kind of complicated. It depends on how many options and how many um, correct answers are. So I'm not going to go through that with you. Uh, but it, suffice to say, it's possible to get like 1.8 out of two or like, you know, 0 0.7 out of two. Okay. If you're concerned about the way it's being calculated, you can email me and I can go through the math with you. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, the key thing, the, the key takeaway from what I just said is do not just select all of them uh, and hope for the best. Okay. Uh, statistically, that is going to work against you. Okay. Um, so just, you know, go through each one and, and choose the one. Um, that are correct as best as you could. Okay, so those are some uh, uh, practice questions. Uh, I, I hope they are okay. Um, let's do a few more and then we're going to take a quick break. Okay, list three factors that affects blood pressure. Uh, briefly describe each uh, how each affects blood pressure. Okay, so this is uh, like on the older version, there are only three lines. And then I, I, I put some, I change it into table. Okay, so it's just small subtle changes. So factors, anybody? Can, can you guys type the answer in the chat or unmute and tell me? Are you guys still there? Just want to say hi. The total blood volume. Yes, that is the first one. Very good. Total blood volume. Total blood volume. Okay. So generally uh, speaking, the more blood you have, higher blood volume, Higher blood volume translates to higher blood pressure. Okay, BP. Okay, so if you if you are dehydrated, then your blood pressure could drop, right? And that could be um, could be dangerous. Okay, uh, if you are well hydrated, okay? you have increased blood volume, your blood pressure will be higher. And okay? that's why people who uh, suffer from hypertension, high blood pressure. Sometimes they take what's called a water pill. Anybody heard of a water pill? I probably mentioned this in lecture. I don't, I've recorded the lecture like, what is it? Like almost a year and a half ago now. So I don't remember what I said in the lecture, but did I mention about water pill? Anybody heard of it? Yeah, what, what is a water pill? Can someone tell me? Yeah, you would take a water pill if you have hypertension, high blood pressure. Is it to release the water that's within the body? Yeah, essentially, right? So when if you take a water pill or the, um, the proper term is um, diuretic, okay, it, it makes you pee, okay? So when you, when you pee a lot, um, you are essentially decreasing your blood volume, right? Uh, and, and that would help you manage the, um, the blood pressure, okay? So that is that. Okay, another factor, someone else. Anyone else wants to tell me what is another factor that affects blood pressure besides total blood volume? Anybody? Thank you, John. Stroke volume is correct, okay? Stroke volume. What is stroke volume? For anybody who um, haven't seen the recording yet, stroke volume is defined as uh, the um, volume of blood, volume of blood uh, eject by the ventricle, okay, per beat. Okay, so each time the ventricle squeezes, how much blood comes out, okay? Uh, and that depends on a lot of factors. Okay? It depends on how strong your heart muscle is, I uh, depend on um, your current level of um, uh, physical state. Like, are, are you resting? Are you running around? Right? A lot of factors affect the stroke volume. But generally speaking, higher, higher stroke volume, the more blood you squeeze out from the ventricle per beat, that translates to higher blood pressure. Okay. 
And the last one, and the last one, I'll do the last one. The last one is the, uh, yep, thank you, vessel diameter. Colleen has that in the chat, vessel diameter, okay? Um, this one goes like this. If you have vasodilation, vasodilation, that means it gets bigger, okay? Vasodilation, this is, means a larger diameter, That means it is going to have lower blood pressure. And then if you have vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction, which means, um, what's the opposite of larger? Uh, smaller? Sorry. Just had a moment of lapse there. Smaller diameter, that is going to be higher blood pressure. Think about a balloon. Okay, you blow a balloon, it's just tiny bit balloon, right? Not, not a big one, tiny balloon. And then you tie the knot, you squeeze the balloon, the pressure goes up inside. You relax, the pressure goes down. Right? You can feel the pressure increase right, when you squeeze something. So essentially, when you do, when you have vasoconstriction, when you squeeze on the blood vessel, you're going to end up having higher pressure um, on the inside. Okay. Now, both of these happen uh, autonomically uh, because it's regulated by your nervous system. We cannot voluntarily control whether a vessel constricts or dilate. In fact, your body will control these uh, dilation constriction to various parts of the body, depending on what the needs are. So if you just eat a meal, okay, and, and you're, you're just sitting in front of the computer, like now, if you eat breakfast and you just sit here, then most of the blood will be diverted to your digestive system, right? So vasodilation to those arteries. And then you don't need as much to your legs because, you know, hopefully you're not jogging outside right now while listening to the lecture. So you don't need a lot of blood going to your legs. So you will have some vasoconstrictions, um, you know, for those vessels. Okay, so this is an autonomic process controlled by your nervous system. Let's just do um, one more before we go on a break. List two problems that needs to be overcame for uh, Venus return. What is Venus return? Anybody want to tell me what Venus return means? Venus return. Anyone? Blood returns uh, from uh, different parts of the body. Thank you. Very good, Nazmu. Uh, uh, is it Nazmu? Is that, is that how you pronounce your name? Or is that is it just... Um... It's Muhammad. Mohammed. It's part okay. of my name, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you, Mohammed. So, uh, uh, Venus return. This is um, to get blood. Get blood back to the heart. Now that's a, that's a more, more challenging than, than, than one would uh, anticipate because of, um, of two things, okay? So again, right, this is my classic drawing of the person. And then this is the heart. Uh, and then the heart is located about two thirds of the way up, we would say, okay? So all the blood, all the blood here, when they need to go back to the heart has to go against gravity to do that, okay? Uh, because the heart is above, above them. So the first problem that we need to overcome, problem number one is gravity. Gravity. And to overcome that, and to overcome that, we have to use um, skeletal, skeletal muscle pump. Okay, so this is explained in more detail in the lecture, but basically your blood vessels in the legs, uh, in the lower parts of the body, in the legs specifically, um, they are surrounded by the leg muscles, okay? So every time you move your legs, every time you walk, right, that, that, those muscles would, would, would contract and that kind of squeezes on the blood vessels that are nearby. And that squeezing force is what's going to help counteract the gravity and, and push the blood upwards, okay? Uh, so there is the problem, and this is how you solve it, okay? Uh, and in fact, the movement of the diaphragm, right? Diaphragm is the, um, here, this is the diaphragm, right? Diaphragm is the, is the, is, it's, a, it's the breathing muscle, right? So the movement of the diaphragm, which we'll learn in lecture four, also helps, you know, push some of those blood uh, back up to, uh, to the heart, okay? Problem number two, problem number two that you have to overcome when it comes to getting back to the heart is low blood pressure, 
Okay, the blood pressure in the veins are much lower compared to the to the arteries because you're so far away from the heart now. Okay, uh, and so when things are when fluids fluids means like air or liquid, right? In this case, we're talking about liquid. Blood is a liquid. Um, when it's a low pressure system, the fluids don't flow very fast. Okay, uh, if you um, uh, 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 live in a house. Uh, 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 then you will know, right? The water pressure sometimes cannot go all the way to the uh, to the top floor. So, like you might have a bathroom that has low uh, water pressure, and then the water don't really come out, right? So, similar to the system, uh, low blood pressure, uh, it's going to cause the flow to be significantly reduced, and as such, sometimes the the, the like if this is the blood vessel, sorry, it's really crowded here. <laughs> Just gonna move it over here. Let's say this is the blood vessel, okay? Sometimes um, you will have the skeletal muscle, which is next to it. These are muscles, the little, little, little uh, oval shaped things. These are the muscles. So when they squeeze, when they squeeze, the blood goes up, but then they would just fall right back down, okay? Because the pressure is so low, which is why we have to have the valves that we talked about, okay? So when the blood goes up, and then if it does fall back down, it's not going to fall all the way back down. It's just going to, you know, be caught by the valve. So next time, you know, you can start from where you left off, okay? Uh, you don't have to start all the way from, from the beginning. So to overcome this, the, we, uh, we use um, the presence of vow. Okay, a uh, quick story. Again, I apologize if I already share this in the, re in the recording. I honestly don't remember. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you, if you think about the last time you were on a, on, a, on a long flight, okay? If you've been on a long flight, you know, maybe, uh, 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 anyway, long flight, okay? <laughs> uh, more than 10 hours flight, okay? Uh, you might take yourself, uh, uh, take off your shoes and make yourself comfortable. Uh, and then if you fall asleep and, and, you know, wake up at the end of the flight and the whole time you didn't leave your seat, it's possible that your feet no longer uh, fit the shoes, especially if the shoes are very snug. Um, and, and, you know, the reason for that is because when you're, when you're not moving, right, uh, and at such a high altitude, your blood start to pull at the lower part of the body, okay, without the movement of the legs, then all these um, muscle pumps are not working, right, so the, the, the blood would pull at the lower extremities, uh, and uh, that extra pressure is going to cause fluid to leak out from your vessels, okay, something that we will talk about in more details after the break, uh, but all that extra fluid will cause the tissue to swell, and then your legs will will swell swell up. Okay, same thing for pregnant women, right? Uh, uh, um, towards the end, third trimester, uh, the the weight of the baby, right? That pushes uh, apply extra pressure on the um, on the on, on the blood, uh, and that causes the leg to swell up. Um, uh, the foot, not the leg, with well, the legs too, but then mostly the foot, the feet uh, uh, swells up as well. Uh, uh, and, um, and it's all because of this, of this reason. Okay. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break, uh, just five minutes. And again, for those of you who came in late, don't worry, we're not going to go the full three hours. We should be done, uh, you know, maybe, maybe 10, 50, 10, 55 today, uh, just because we started a little bit late with the orientation stuff. Okay. But I'll see you in five minutes. Okay. 947 ish. Okay. We're going to, we're going to resume. Okay. Uh, go take a break. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Let's keep going. So the next question, a patient has a breathing rate of 30 breaths per minute, a heart rate of 70 beats per minute. If the stroke volume is 80 mils per beat, calculate the cardiac output. Okay, so what is the formula for cardiac output? Um, not enough space here, so I'm just gonna move it to the side here. Move it to the side here. So cardiac output, cardiac output equals to, oh boy, sorry, equals to stroke volume, stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. Heart rate. Okay, uh, that is the formula. So cardiac output is basically the volume of blood 
that is being circulated throughout the body per minute. Okay, so milliliters per minute or liters per minute, um, depending on the question. Stroke volume, we talked about this earlier. It is the volume of blood per beat. So how much blood is ejected from the ventricle, uh, the left ventricle specifically, per, uh, per squeeze. And heart rate is uh, basically what it sounds like, the beat, beats per minute. Okay, so uh, in our question, in a question over here, uh, what was it? 70 beats per minute, right? There is a heart rate of 70 beats per minute and a stroke volume of 80 beats per minute. This uh, 30 thing is uh, it's uh, extra information that we do not need. So we just plug it in. We just plug it in. We will have, let me see, equals to 80 milliliters per beat multiplied by 70 beats per minute. Okay. Uh, and just like you learn in math class, the beats kind of cancel each other and we will have 80 times 70 which is 5600 okay uh, i i'm not going to give you like obscure numbers they will always be like nice numbers but if you do feel better with a calculator then have one uh 5600 milliliters per minute that is 5.6 liters per minute okay so if you didn't know, 1,000 milliliters in one liter. Okay. So that's the answer, 5.6 liters per minute. Now, is that healthy? Is that not healthy? Is that normal? It's hard to say, okay, depending on the baseline uh, measurements of the person, right? Um, you cannot have a generalized uh, number, okay? It, it depends on the state of the person, okay? Maybe, maybe this is someone who, you know, just recovering from a, from a heart attack, then maybe it's a good number, okay? Uh, it's hard to say without more information. But uh, that's the, uh, that's the uh, equation, uh, and you should know the units associated with each of the, um, the parts of the equation. Okay, complete the following chart regarding osmotic pressure. This chart might be missing uh, if you, uh, in the older version, uh, but it's something you can easily create uh, on a blank piece of paper. Uh, osmotic pressure and blood pressure. Now, this is um, this whole thing is about a concept called capillary uh, uh, effect. Okay, uh, uh, I explained this in detail in the lecture recording. Um, so you know, make sure you 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 go watch that. Okay, if we have time, maybe I'll explain again later on. Okay, but um, in a nutshell, okay, very, 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 very briefly, very, very briefly, okay. Again, watch the details one in the lecture recordings. Uh, this is your, this is your blood capillaries, right? Okay, blood capillaries. And you just have to believe me that the capillaries are actually uh, porous, okay? So things leaks out, things goes in. It's part of the normal process, okay? Now, there are two forces that are in play here. One of them is blood pressure. The other is osmotic pressure. So generally speaking, generally speaking, blood pressure is responsible for pushing fluid out of the capillaries, okay? So you have blood pressure pushing things out, okay? And for the capillaries, one side would be connected to the arterial, the other side would be connected to the venule. So there is the arterial side, and then there's the venous side, okay? So the blood pressure will be pushing fluid out. As you go away from the artery, the blood pressure would drop, okay? Would drop like this. So. Blood pressure here is about, let's say, um, 30 mmHg, millimeter mercury. That's a unit for measuring blood pressure. And over here, blood pressure is about, you know, 15 millimeter mercury. Okay, so blood pressure is responsible for pushing fluid out. 
what's outside of the blood vessel? Well, it's just your tissue, right? Tissue. That's where your cells are. And remember all the cells that you learned, the squamous, the columna, you know, whatever, whatever. That's going to be in your tissue. Okay. So this blood pressure will be responsible for pushing fluid out. Okay. And it's going to get weaker as we progress from the arterial side to the venous side. Not surprising because you are further away from the heart, right? On the venous side. So to put that in words, this is how it is. Again, right? That diagram is in the full lecture recording. Yeah, and you should go watch it later on. Okay. You will have a better understanding. Okay. Blood pressure. What is it created by? Blood pressure is created by created by uh, uh, ventricular contraction. Ventricular contraction. Okay. And it is blood pushing against the vessel wall. Okay. So the heart squeezes. That pushes the blood forward in your vessel. That creates pressure, which pushes against the vessel wall. If the vessel walls are like, um, like, a, like a pipe, completely sealed, then it won't be leaking, right? But the capillaries are leaky. They are porous, okay? So fluid will get pushed out. I have to emphasize, it is not blood that get pushed out of the capillaries. It is the fluid portion of blood that get pushed out. What's the difference between the fluid portion and the blood? Well, we'll learn more in, in the next lecture, but um, the fluid, you can think of it as like the water, water portion of the blood that's being pushed out. Um, there are dissolved minerals in it. There are maybe some proteins, right? Um, these are the things that get pushed out by the blood pressure, okay? The actual blood cells that makes the blood red, those kind of things, they don't get pushed out, okay? So effect on capillary exchange, okay? Blood pressure pushes fluid. Again, fluid. Okay, I'm going to underline fluid, okay? Not blood, okay? Major confusion. If we are pushing blood out of blood vessels, we will all have internal bleedings, okay? That is, that is not a pretty sight, okay? Um, just fluids, okay? So BP pushes fluid out, out out of the capillaries. Okay, only capillaries are um, mentioned here because we're talking about capillary exchange. Okay, arterial side versus venous side. I just showed you in the diagram, right? That the BP on the arterial side, arterial side, is greater than BP on the venous side. Okay. I'm going to give you a moment to catch up with copying the stuff. And I will take any questions if there are any. I'm just going to go off of the topic, well, off of the. Yeah, sure. For the diffusion. So you're just saying basically, it's just the high, the oxygen, high oxygen is just going back out to the tissue while low carbon dioxide is going in. Yeah, okay. So, um, so I see is... going in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will, uh, I will explain that in right here. Now, um, the blood pressure pushes things out. So what, what Colleen is asking is um, there is also a third factor that's mentioned in the lecture, and that's diffusion. Okay, so diffusion, the direction. Okay, so, so for blood pressure, the direction is always out of the vessel, right? The fluid always gets pushed out. When it comes to diffusion, um, the direction is dictated by the concentration difference on the inside versus the outside. For example, if the oxygen is high here, right, high O2, 
compared to the outside, then which way will oxygen go? Out, okay? If we're talking about another gas, like low carbon dioxide inside and high carbon dioxide inside, outside, then the carbon dioxide will come in, okay? So it all depends on wh where is high, where is low, and it will always go from high concentration to low concentration, okay? So a couple of things to, to know here. Number one, it's dependent on the concentration gradient. Gradient means the difference for that particular substance only. So what's happening to the oxygen has no effect on what's happening to the carbon dioxide because they have their own gradient, okay? And number two, uh, the situation, if it's reversed, if for some reason there are more carb uh, oxygen outside than inside, if I change this to high, oops, if I change this to high O2, and then we have low O2 inside, then it's going to be the other way around, okay? Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. No problem. All right. I hope we are all clear about what blood pressure does at the capillaries. Basically, it pushes things out. Okay. If that's the only force that is at play here, then we are going to be pretty swollen up. Okay. Because all the fluid will leak out to the tissue and we'll be losing fluid out of our blood vessels. Uh, our blood pressure would drop over time because we're losing the fluid. Uh, and, and that's not a good thing. That is not a good thing. But fortunately, as with most things in nature, there is a counteracting force that opposes blood pressure. That counteracting force is called osmotic pressure. And I know I keep on saying this, but this is explained in more details in the videos. But for those who haven't watched the video, here is a quick uh, explanation of what osmotic pressure is, okay? Let's say I have a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable membrane, okay? Semi-permeable means it only lets things, some things go through and not others, okay? So let's say I have these um, salt particles. You know what? Let's just call them solute. You guys know what solute is? Solute, S-O-L-U-T-E, solute. Stuff that are dissolved, right, in a, in a solution, right? So it could be salt, N-A-C-L, could be magnesium, could be proteins, could be whatever, okay? So let's say we have some solute here. And you can see the way I'm drawing the solute, they are bigger than the pores in the semi-permeable membrane, okay? So at as, as it stands right now, we have a higher solute concentration high solute concentration. Square bracket means concentration, okay? On the left side and on the right side, we have low solute concentration. Here is the key thing, okay? Listen up, right? The solute, the pink circles are too big to cross the membrane. And of course, this whole thing is in water, okay? Um, so only water can move, only water can move. So my question is, which way will water move okay i'm gonna call this a i'm gonna call this b i'm gonna i'm gonna launch a poll and i'm gonna see what you think okay uh relaunch the poll okay if you think if you think the water will go from chamber a to b choose option a if you think it's gonna go from b to a choose option b and if you are not really sure then you can choose option C. Sure. There you go. Okay. My question is, which way will water go? Okay. I have half the response. Waiting for another seven six responses okay so uh 60 percent of people choose b and that is the correct answer okay water here is the key thing to know right i i told you the membrane 
is um, semi-permeable. It does not let the pain circle move, okay? If this was just a very porous membrane, if the pain circles could move, then the pain circles, the solute, would go from the A to the B, okay? But they cannot move. They cannot move. So the only thing that can move here is water. So water will move towards the left side to try to dilute out the concentration, right? To make it equal, right? And a, a good example to help you understand this is um, if you, and you, you should try it to help you remember this, okay? Take a spoon of salt and you put it in your mouth. Don't swallow it, obviously. Just put, keep it in your mouth. And then after, I don't know, like uh, 15 seconds or so, what would happen? What would happen is you would have all the saliva being sucked out, right, from your oral cavity, right, uh, uh, into your into your mouth, um, because of that salt, right. So the salt essentially is sucking out all the moisture from your cells, right. And this is exactly what's happening. If you have an area that has more solute, right, the salt, right, than the other area, and water is the only thing that can move then the water will always move towards the saltier end. It will always move towards the, the side that has a higher solute concentration. And we have a term for this, okay? Higher osmolarity, okay? Osmolarity. We will, we will use this word quite a lot, um, you know, throughout the course. But basically, water will always move towards the side that, has a, that is saltier, okay? Uh, yeah, someone said potato will also be a good experiment. Yes, you could do that. But uh, I like the I like the putting the salt in your mouth because it, it's a very um, <laughs> real experience that you will feel. And, and it's an unpleasant experience, I'm going to tell you. And uh, that would probably help you remember it um, uh, better. But definitely, potato definitely works as well. Now, so what does that have to do with what we are talking about? Well, osmotic pressure is essentially talking about the pressure created by a difference in solute concentration between two points, okay? So this, this next part, you're just gonna have to believe me. Uh, I can't explain too much over here. We have higher solute concentration on the inside of the blood vessels shown here by the black dots. And these black dots could be, again, electrolytes, right? So sodium chloride, magnesium, potassium, you know, calcium, all these stuff, uh, along with dissolved proteins and, and your red cells, white cells, all these things that are in the blood contributes to the solute concentration, contributes to the osmolarity on the inside. So you have a higher concentration on the inside of the vessels compared to the outside, okay? Now, the cells are not going anywhere. The proteins are not going anywhere because the pores are too small for them to fit through. So the only thing that could go through uh, would be water, right, the fluid. So based on what we discussed in the, in the example below, which way will the fluid move? Into the vessel or out of the vessel? Let me think about that for a couple of seconds and I'm gonna tell you the answer. Into. Into is correct. And hopefully that's what most of you are thinking, okay? So that's going to create a force. Uh, is that even green? That's not green, sorry. I'm going to be colorblind here today. So there we go. It's going to be sucking it in, okay? Sucking it in like this. Now, unlike the blood pressure, the osmotic pressure, which is represented by the green arrows here, does not change from the arterial side versus the venous side. Okay, because the amount of proteins and electrolytes and cells that is on one end does not substantially change when you go to the other side of the vessel. So um, the osmotic pressure, uh, again, that's because of a difference in the concentration on the inside versus outside, will be similar on both sides. So OP on the arterial side, it's going to be approximately 20 mmHg. These numbers are just hypothetical, right? Uh, it might change depending on which vessel we're talking about. So don't, don't memorize the numbers. They're not important. What's important here is to know that BP drops from arterial side to venous side. However, the osmotic pressure remains unchanged. So let's go back to our handy dandy chart right here. It is osmotic pressure created by, oops, created by 
solute con solute concentration gradient. Gradient just like it's it's just a fancy word of saying difference, right? So there is a difference on the inside versus the outside. If there is no difference, then there is no net fluid movement. Okay. So fluid OP draws fluid, draws fluid, again, not blood, just the water component, into, into the capillaries. Okay. And here I'm just gonna put a little footnote, a little footnote right here. Okay. Fluid moves towards higher osmolarity. Again, osmolarity, just a fancy word for stuff that are dissolved in a fluid, okay? And the stuff that we are talking about here, electrolytes, proteins, cells. Arterial psi versus venous psi. Uh, unchanged, right? OP is constant on the arterial side and is the same, which is is the same, is the same on the arterial side and the venous side. Okay. Could you scroll up just a little bit if possible? Yeah, sure, sure. There we Thank go. you. No problem. Any question before we move on? Okay, this is a this is a core concept, and um, we'll be using this for other things as we move on into the um, into the, the course. But uh, any quick questions? Great. Okay, one last thing uh, that we should uh, uh, discuss here. Okay, over here, blood pressure is 30 out push your fluid out while we have 20 mmHg drawing fluid in. So the net, the net, net pressure here, net pressure is going to be 10 out, right? 10 unit of pressure pushing fluid out. So on the arterial side, we will have fluid lost, okay? Do you understand that? Right? Remember, these are like opposing forces, right? Um, you have more force pushing fluid out than drawing them in. So overall, you, you, you end up losing fluid. Does that make sense? Okay, what about on the other side? On the other side, what is the net, net result, net pressure? Five, which way? What do you guys say, in or out? Five. In, in, exactly. Thank you, Mohammed. Five in, right? Because on the venous side, the uh, osmotic pressure is higher than the blood pressure, right? Okay, so you, you, you will lose some fluid, but you will bring some back, okay? And then here's the key thing, if, if, you, if you think about this a little bit more, you actually will not be able to bring back all of the fluid that you've lost on the arterial side. You're losing more than you're bringing it in, right? Because the pressure that's pushing things out is 10 and the pressure that's bringing it in, it's five. So you, you're still missing some, right? Okay, so where does that extra bit go? Uh, and, and why are we doing this? Why are we losing it and then bringing it back in later on? Um, that is uh, something you will learn next lecture. But I just wanna plan that in your head, right? To, to, to think about, the situation over here. So a little bit of a cliffhanger there. Uh, and that's that. Okay, let's let's move on to the 
true or false. Let's move on to true or false. Um, I don't know if you guys know this. I tried this with uh, previous uh, uh, semesters. Uh, but did you guys know that there, like, if, if you pull up your, um, oh, I think, you know what? I think they changed that. Never mind. Never mind. They used to be able to, uh, to uh, you know, have a, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down icon or something. But I, I, I don't think that shows up in the chat anymore. Uh, never mind. Never mind. Okay. I was going to ask you guys to do like thumbs up, thumbs down so we can do these two or false. Yes. Yeah, you guys have, but I, I don't know how to see it though. You, it used to be on the chart. What's that? You there's a reaction. reaction. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reaction thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So so you guys, if you know how to do that, then you can do that. Uh, if you don't, that's okay as well. Uh, I don't think I can see the reaction though because uh, I would have to pull up like the entire grid um, and then I will be recording everybody's um, name on the video. I don't want to do that, uh, but that's okay. Uh, here we go. You can just type true or false in the chat box, okay? Uh, here we go. The tricuspid and the bicuspid valves are both known as atrioventricular valve. Is that true or false? Okay, you can just quickly type it in or quickly do a reaction for me, and I will write down the answers. That is, uh, that is actually true. Yes, very good. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, next one, the pulmonary arteries takes oxygen-rich blood from the heart to the capillaries in the lungs. Is that true or false? That is actually false. And the reason is this is oxygen poor. Okay, We, we do not want to take the oxygenated blood to the lungs. We take it to the lungs because we want to re-oxygenate it. Next one, the, a stroke occurs when one or more of the coronary arteries are blocked. Is that true or is that false? What do you guys think? Okay, one true, anyone else? True, true. Okay, so we have many trues and then some reactions. This is actually false. This is actually false. It's a tricky one. Okay, a stroke happens when there is a clot in the vessel in the brain. Okay, uh, when you have a block in the coronary arteries. Okay, the coronary artery supplies blood, oxygenated blood to the heart. Right. So when one of those things are blocked, you will have a heart attack. Heart attack. Okay. The fancy word for a heart attack is. Um, Myocardial infarction, right? Or MI. That is in the lecture notes. But this one is false. Uh, so a stroke and a heart attack is essentially the same thing, a block vessel, uh, but it happens in different locations. Okay. The AV node is known as the pacemaker of the heart. Pacemaker of the heart. Okay. The pacemaker sets the rhythm of the heart rate. Uh, and that is the SA note. So this is false. Next one, systolic pressure is the pressure in blood vessels when ventricles relax. Ventricle relax. That is false. It is when the ventricle contract. Okay. The, uh, uh, the, the other pressure is called the diastolic pressure. Osmotic pressure will increase if blood sodium level drops. Oh, this one is heavy. Okay, so let's let's think about that. Give you a moment to think about that. Is it true or is it false? Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to say true, Ruby, false, Abdullah, true. Okay, let's think about it. Okay, so let's see. Uh, where is my picture? Okay. You don't have to draw this. You can just watch. Okay, so if the sodium blood level, blood sodium level drops, in other words, the sodium in the blood, right? If that drops, then we would have less dots in the blood. Okay, we'll have less dots in the blood. If you have less dots in the blood, then the difference between the inside and the outside 
is not as great, which means the green arrows will now be shorter, right? Okay, the green arrows will now be shorter because you don't have as big of a concentration gradient. Okay, so you will be retaining less fluid. If you retain less fluid, then your blood pressure would go down. Okay, so osmotic pressure will actually decrease if blood sodium level drops. So this is false. Okay, you heard of people like, you know, if their blood pressure drops too low, then you infuse them with saline, right? Saline is basically salt solution. So the saline helps retain the fluid, right, from the surrounding tissue and boost your blood pressure. Okay, so it could be, a, this could be a multi-select question, right? Uh, select all the correct statements. So I give you a bunch of these and you choose all the true ones or select all the incorrect statements. And then you would choose all the false ones. Any uh, questions, concerns? Is this okay? Like, am I going too fast? All right, you guys okay? Okay, no, no comment is, it means it's okay, right? <laughs> I assume, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good assumption. Uh, moving on, moving on. Okay, this is uh, another new thing that was added uh, to the, uh, you know, to the, to the workbook, okay, um, so. Here we go. There are three graphs that we talked about in the lecture recordings, uh, and they show the comparison, uh, uh, you know, between various factors in the vessel. So the first one is blood pressure versus vessel type. This one is probably the easiest. Okay, so we have your your, your graph here. This is the artery, capillaries, and veins. Okay, in the in the PowerPoint slides, I think it's. Uh, separated even more uh, in more details, like you have the arterioles and the aorta and whatnot, but you know, we're just gonna keep it simple. We have the artery, which is closest to the heart, capillaries in between, and then the veins at the very end. So what happens to the blood pressure as the blood goes, you know, from the arteries all the way to the veins, okay? So um, basically it goes down, okay? So like this. Now the graph in the, PowerPoint is a little bit more, uh, like it fluctuates a little bit and then it goes down, okay? So the fluctuation is due to the contraction and the relaxation, the systole and the diastole. Uh, so it fluctuates between 120 and 80 at the beginning. And then the fluctuation eventually tapers off uh, uh, when you go to the veins, meaning once you get past the capillaries, it doesn't matter whether the heart is contracting or relaxing, it does not change the blood pressure in those vessels. But I just want to keep it simple, okay? Um, so I'm going to draw this, okay? Something like this, okay? So uh, blood pressures versus vessel type. Blood pressure decreases as you move away from the heart, okay? So BP is lowest, lowest in veins. That's the key takeaway here. Velocity. Velocity means speed. Okay, so it depends on two factors. Depends on number one, blood pressure. Okay, higher blood pressure, faster, veloc higher velocity, faster speed. Okay, higher BP equals faster, which makes sense, right? Okay, we talked about this already right? with the water pressure and stuff like that. Second one, it's a little bit confusing. For some people, this is the vessel diameter. Okay, vessel diameter. Bigger, bigger equals to what do you think? Is bigger faster or slower? Slower. Slow, slower. Yeah. Okay. You know what? Let's let's do a poll. Okay. Let's do a poll. Um, relaunch the poll. Big vessel, faster or slower? If you think it's fast, faster, choose A. Slower, choose B. Faster, choose A. Slower, choose B. Okay. 
Okay. I'll right, show the results. Now, that, that's why I say this is a confusing thing for people. Uh, and, and I know why it's confusing. It's partly my fault. <laughs> but the correct answer is um, the bigger it is, the faster. And I'll explain. Okay, hold on. Faster. Okay. Um, what you, the, the people who choose uh, slower, I think, I think the reason is this. Okay, you're thinking big vessel, lower blood pressure. That's why it's slower, right? Okay. But the key thing here is we are looking at these factors independently, okay? We are just looking at vessel diameter. We cannot consider like many factors at the same time, right? We cannot say, oh, but if, if, if vessel diameter changes, then blood pressure is going to change. And then that's going to, you know, alter the speed. Then, then we are considering too many variables at the same time, okay? If we were only to look at vessel diameter, then bigger vessel means faster. Think about driving. The more lanes you have, the faster the traffic, okay? If you have like six, seven lanes, traffic is going to go faster compared to, say, two lanes, right? Okay? So through the, using that logic, that's why bigger vessels will be faster. Now, is, does, does that mean blood pressure is not going to matter? No, it, it matters, okay? But then it would be a different category when we look at it on its own. Okay, uh, so Mel asks, is this in the workbook? Uh, no, this is like a new chart that I add, added in. Uh, uh, there are some like very subtle difference between the, the, the workbook and this. Um, uh, so you, you will have to add this extra bit. In. I do apologize uh, for that. Um, okay, does this make sense? So um, the, um, the here is the artery, capillaries, and veins. Uh, and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very fast at the beginning. It's going to come slow and then it's going to speed up again. Okay. So the takeaway point here is the takeaway point here is uh, the speed. The speed is slowest at capillaries. Capillaries. Okay. Are we good? Any question? I know this is a little bit, uh, you know, confusing perhaps. No? Okay. Cross-section area versus blood vessel type. Cross-sectional area just means that, you know, if, 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 you, if you count all the areas of all the vessels, if you lay it all out, which one would have the most? Okay. So it looks something like this. Uh, a, C, V, like this. Okay. So you will have most capillary cross-sectional area, not so much for arteries and veins. Okay. That's because we are, our body is mostly covered with capillaries, right? Okay. Like the aorta is very big, but you only have one of them. Okay. Uh, capillaries are really small, but you have a lot of them. So in total, you cover more areas with the capillaries than you would with the uh, aorta. It's like, you know, having one $100 bill versus, you know, a thousand $5 bills, right? So the denomination is smaller for $5 bills, but if you have a lot of them, then in totality, that's greater sum compared to just one single $100 uh, bills, right? One single aorta. Okay, moving on. Uh, fill in the blanks, fill in the blanks. The three layers of the heart wall. Yes. Sorry. So can you go back? But like, um, sure. Where I can view the entire. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, like this. Yeah. Take a, yeah. Could... Yeah. Feel free to take a screenshot, right? Like if you guys uh, need to, right. Uh, using the snipping tool, if you're using windows uh, and you guys can get a loan, right. If you don't have a, if you don't have a computer, you can, uh, the school has a computer uh, device loan program that you can get a computer. Yes, Colleen, you have a question? Um, the, at the cross-sectional, so that would be the gas would slow down. They would slow down. The blood would slow down. The cross-sectional so, area? Yeah. But not so much. Yeah, not so much that. The cross-sectional area just uh, essentially describes how much 
of the body is covered by those vessels. Okay, so a majority of the uh, vessel is going to be covered with covering covered by uh, capillaries. Okay, um, basically, anytime you have like a paper cut or whatever, right? That that's the capillaries being cut. Okay. Okay. Uh, may I just share that the screenshot on a Mac, if you're using a Mac, it is shift command four. Good to know, shift command four. Thank you for that. Okay, fill in the blanks, fill in the blanks. Three layers of the heart wall starting at the deepest layer. So the deepest layer is the layer that is in direct contact with the blood. So that is the uh, endocardium, endocardium, okay. Outside of the endocardium is the thickest layer of the wall, which is the myocardium. Myo means muscle, because this is muscle part of the heart. And finally, on the outside of the heart, that is the epi, epicardium. So this is in direct contact with the blood, the muscle, the thickest layer, and the epicardium is on the um, is the outermost layer of the heart wall, uh, and and that is in continuation with a double layer membrane that goes around the heart. That takes us to the next fill in the blanks, a double layer membrane that surrounds the heart that is called the peri. Cardium, okay, pericardium, okay. So the pericardium kind of anchors the heart in place because you know always beating. You don't want to jump all over your chest cavity. Uh, the pericardium anchors it to the adjacent tissues. Uh, make sure it stays in one place. Now it's a double layer membrane. So there is an outer layer and then there is an inner layer. Okay, the outer layer is called the parietal. Parietal pericardium. Okay, so like if I were to open up my chest, the membrane that you'll be staring at, that would be the parietal pericardium. The inner layer, which is the layer that is fused with the epicardium, that is the visceral, visceral pericardium. Okay, visceral. So this and this here, this one and this one, they are continuous. Okay, they are basically the same thing for our purpose. Okay, so you, you we will learn many other organs, and uh, they will all have their own membranes. The visceral is always the one that is in contact with the with the organ and then the parietal is always going to be the one that's outside okay so visceral v for very close that's how i remember it okay very close to the organ visceral okay now between the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium there is the parietal fluid uh, and that keeps the two layers lubricated as they rub against each other um it prevents like wearing and tearing, right? Okay, next one. Name two atrial ventricular valves. We've done this many times today already. Hopefully you remember them. Uh, it is the tricuspid on the right side and the bicuspid on the left side. Name two semilunar valves. That is the pulmonary and the aortic semilunar valves. The left ventricle has the thickest myocardium. Okay? The left ventricle is the one that will squeeze the blood through the aorta and then goes throughout the entire body, right? So you have to have very strong muscle because okay? you got to create enough force to distribute about throughout the body, right? Compare that to the right ventricle. The right ventricle does not need as much force because you're just going to the lungs. The lungs are like right beside you, right? So you don't want to squeeze too hard, right? So left side, left ventricle, 
thick as myocardium. The right atrium collects blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Okay, you can spell it out yourself. The left atrium collects blood from the pulmonary, pulmonary vein. The natural pacemaker is the SA node, the sinoatrial nodes. The speed of blood flow is dependent on, uh, we talked about this, blood pressure and vessel diameter. Cardiac output is calculated by multiplying stroke volume and uh, what's the other one? Heart rate. Heart rate. Next one. Think about the graphs, right? Blood pressure is typically lowest in veins. The speed of blood flow is typically lowest in capillaries. You need to slow down in order for the capillary exchange to take place, in order for oxygen to be exchanged. Next one, an electrocardiogram or ECG is a graphical record of the electrical impulses in the heart. It is useful because it is non-invasive way to diagnose these things. The hardening of arteries due to built up of fatty substances is called atheral sclerosis. AR, okay. Oh boy. ARTH, atherosclerosis. It shouldn't be atheral. Uh, yeah, there's arterial sclerosis and then there's atherosclerosis. Uh, for us, it means the same thing. Yeah, but you're right. There is also the other one as well. Um, the something artery supplies the heart muscle with oxygenated blood. Uh, coronary. Uh, liver, the liver is the hepatic, and then uh, for the kidneys, it is the renal. Name two phases of the cardiac cycle that is the systole and diastole. So the systolic pressure is the pressure uh, in the arteries during ventricular contraction, while the diastolic pressure is the pressure, um, sorry, that's a spelling mistake right here, pressure of the blood inside the artery during ventricular relaxation. Okay, so that is the fill in the blanks. It's probably one of those, the most mundane thing <laughs> to do. Um, in the tutorial, but, but those are the answers. Okay, uh, long answer questions. Does anybody uh, have one, have any requests? Okay. Can I, you scroll I would, all the way up, please? Yeah, sure. All the way, like right. over here? No, like here. Oh, like here? Yeah, thanks. Okay. You good now? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Um, so we, um, I, I mean, I don't have time to take up all of them uh, and I don't have to. Uh, I mean, some of these are pretty self-explanatory, um, but I will take any requests, okay? Uh, I'll give you guys like, you know, a couple minutes to read through them. Uh, if you have any requests for any one of them, 
I would do them. There is a request for number four, number seven. Any, anything else? Uh, what? Why don't we start with those? And uh, if, uh, if, if anyone else have any other additional requests, uh, we will do them. Uh, I will do the application questions after as well. So, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at number four. Describe similarities and differences between arteries and veins. The description can be related to properties, structures, um, and functions. Um, so this one is similar to the chart that we fill in earlier. I'm going to just go back here to redirect you. Um, here are some examples, right, of uh, differences and similarities between them, okay? Uh, so uh, other things that you can mention, uh, for example, is um, that uh, uh, the arteries are not, you know what, I, I think this is a pretty exhaustive list um, uh, between arteries and, uh, and, and, and veins. Uh, in terms of the structure, um, we didn't really talk go into too much detail. I mean, there are different layers in the in the uh, in the vessels, right? The endothelium and all that stuff. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but you can find them in the online textbook, I'm sure. Uh, and you're not responsible for them. Um, uh, the only structural difference would be uh, that the arteries are thicker, the lumen is a little bit smaller, uh, and the veins they have they have valves, right? But all that will be summarized here. Is there uh, any additional things that you will worry about uh, for this question? It was just really the structure, nothing yeah. else. Yeah, just basically structure. Right? In terms yeah. of properties, uh, I would say the arteries are more elastic uh, compared to the um, to the veins uh, because the, you know actually when the when the blood goes through it, they expand a little bit. And then they squeeze back, and it's that recoiling force, that elasticity, that help propels uh, uh, propel the blood forward. Okay, uh, veins don't need that elasticity because, as you know, the pressure is much lower, right? So that is that. Okay, number seven. Uh, atherosclerosis, and explain the relationship. Uh, Oh, I see what you were saying earlier. Like, okay, Mel was telling me that I sp actually spelled it wrong here. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was thinking about, I thought you were talking about something else. Yeah, so this is A uh, without the R. Um, thank you. So let's go back to here. Uh, uh, describe what happens in atherosclerosis and explain its relationship to coronary artery disease. Okay, so uh, basically, let's, let's, let's talk about what atherosclerosis is first, right? Okay. Uh, and then we will move on from there. There is your regular vessel. Um, could be an artery, could be a or whatever. And, and what happens is um, blood, they don't like to have a rough surface. Okay? They, they like to have a smooth surface. And every time there is a rough surface that's being exposed, for example, uh, like, like if, I, if I put a little thumbtack here, that would expose a rough surface and then the blood would clot on it. Uh, and, um, and that's a good thing, right? To stop the bleeding. However, uh, if you have too much, you know, um, uh, uh, cholesterol intake, for example, or like trans fat, we don't really have trans fat anymore. Canada banned, the Canadian government banned uh, the use of trans fat, I think like three years ago or something. So there's no more trans fat. But uh, trans fat is something that builds up in the body very easily. We cannot get rid of it. Uh, same thing for some bad cholesterol, for example, fatty substance. If they start building up in the inside of the artery, then what happens is now there is a rough surface instead of the smooth endothelium. So what happens is the blood will start stick to it, okay? And then uh, it will create a little bit of an inflammatory response. Uh, and then it's kind of like a snowball effect after that the uh, blood cells would just keep on sticking on it and sticking on it. So over time, what happens is you will create a narrowing in the blood vessel. And this part, this part is actually going to be weakened, weakened, okay? So a couple of problems here. This part is weakened, meaning, remember, like if this is like an artery, right? Then the pressure is really high, right? Okay, 
So now you tell me, okay? You as in like the class, okay? Anybody can answer. If the buildup here caused the lumen to be smaller, do you think the pressure is going to get even higher or is the pressure going to drop lower? Higher or lower? Let's poll again. Love doing the polls. Higher, choose A. Lower, choose B. Okay. So, um, you know, half, half here. Uh, actually, it's going to be higher, right? Because now it's smaller, right? The lumen is smaller. It's, we wrote this down earlier, right? Like uh, if it's vasoconstriction, then the pressure is going to be higher, right? So the blood is really trying to squeeze through this narrow space. It's going to increase the blood pressure. But here is the problem, right? Here's the problem. The wall is weakened because of all these plaque that is building up. So it's possible that the, the high pressure will now burst the artery. Okay, uh, and and if this happens in the brain, then it's it could be deadly, right? Now, have you guys heard of an aneurysm? Aneurysm, right? Like people, you you sometimes read about this on the news, right? Like uh, someone uh, fall on the floor uh, and hit their head, and then they die. Um, and that's because probably inside their head, they have a, a vessel that's like this. And the, and the fall, the impact, caused the weakened vessel to rupture. Okay? And, and that causes all the blood to come out. Um, and that's what we call like a, like a brain aneurysm, for example. right? Um, but uh, that, that, that's just one consequence. Now, what we're trying to focus on is the, uh, what we call like a CAD, coronary artery diseases. Okay? So uh, we have two possibility here. We have like a partial partial blockade. Okay, so it's something like this, partial blockade, or we have like a complete, complete blockade. Okay, so partial blockade, you're going to have like angina, okay, chest pain, okay, uh, because you're not able to deliver as much uh, uh, oxygen to the heart muscle, for example, if this happens in a heart a coronary artery, right, then every time you physically exert yourself, like um, running up, uh, not even running, like walking up a flight of stairs, then that sudden increased demand in oxygen is not being met, and then you would have chest pain, okay, angina, okay, so to, to, to fix that problem, uh, the doctor would prescribe blood thinner, right, uh, like aspirin, aspirin, other than fixing headache, it's also a blood thinner. So if the blood is thinner, it's able to move through these uh, clogged, partially clogged vessels easier, right? Um, they could give you um, one of those um, uh, 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 pills that you put underneath the tongue. Uh, it's nitroglycerin, um, same thing as the explosive, but that has a vasodilation property uh, and that causes the vessel to open up and then you're able to restore the uh, blood supply. Okay. If it's complete blockade, then we have a much bigger problem. You're actually going to have a heart attack. Again, if this, I'm talking about uh, this happening in the coronary artery, right? So if you survive the heart attack, then, um, well, first of all, let's talk about what happens. If, if, if there's a heart attack and the person is able to get to the hospital quick enough, uh, they have these things called uh, clot. Sorry, I'll just write out. It's uh, hard to pronounce. Clot. Buster, okay, clot buster. Um, uh, there are many different types. On top of my head, there's something called like streptomycin. Uh, so as soon as you administer that, they are designed to bust the clot, exactly as the name implies, uh, and that reopens the vessel. But you have to do it quickly, right? Otherwise, there will be too much damage. Uh, 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 and then they could also, uh, afterwards, right, they could also do angioplasty, right? All this is in the lecture notes, by the way. Okay, so if you haven't watched the lecture recordings yet, uh, you can watch it after. 
to, to get a better sense. So angioplasty is when you stick a balloon, right, into the vessel, right, and then you puff up the balloon and that flattens out the plague uh, and then it reopens the vessels, okay? Um, and sometimes if it's like too blocked and you cannot insert the balloon, then you have to do a coronary bypass, which would then circumvent the blocked area. You would get a vessel that basically goes around the block area like that, okay? So that is that. Okay, uh, let's go through the application questions. Um, application questions right here, first one. Hi, sir. Hi. I have a question, so. Please, yeah, go ahead. Um, what happens like if there's a leaking valve? A leaky yeah. valve, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's a good question. It depends where the leaky valve uh, happens, okay? If the leaky valve happens uh, in the in the legs, for example, then the blood, it, wait, sorry, are you talking about like a, like a valve in a vein or are you talking about the, the valve uh, in yeah. the heart? In the heart. In the heart, okay. So yeah. if the valve is leaky uh, in the heart, um, say the tricuspid or the bicuspid or whatever, one of those four, if they're leaky, then the blood will go backwards. Okay, the function of the valve is to ensure blood goes forward and never backwards. But if it's leaky, uh, and that could be due to many as many reasons, you can have a, a congenital effect, which means the person is born with a defect, um, or sometimes you can have a blood infection that caused the valve to um, to to become swollen and they don't close properly. So those leaky valves is going to cause the blood to go backwards. And when blood is going backwards, you reduce the efficiency at blood circulation. Okay. So the person might be suffering from a little bit of a shortness of breath because they're not getting good circulation. And you are also mixing blood uh, between the oxygenated and the oxygen uh, poor blood. Uh, and that reduces your oxygen low in the body. Okay. So typically uh, you would have to fix that. Okay. Like if a baby is born with a congenital heart defect, um, defective valve, for example, in this case, then they would have to do surgery to replace the valve, okay? Uh, in adults as well, but then usually adults, uh, they can accommodate a little bit better. Uh, they, it's not like a super emergency um, condition, uh, but there you have it. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, thanks, yeah. I was wondering. Okay, good. All right, so th these are application questions, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to talk about it and then we're going to do a multiple choice question. Um, and that will show you what application questions are like on the test. Okay. And quiz. All right. So first one, let's read it together. I mean, like I'll, I'll read it to you. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot we're <laughs> not in class. Uh, congestive heart failure or CHF occurs when the ventricles fail to empty its content completely. Speculate what happens to someone if CHF occurs on the right side of the heart. What about CHF on the left side of the heart? Okay, so I will I will explain over here. All right. Oh boy, there we go. Okay, so let's let's draw our heart. By now you know that the heart doesn't actually look like this, but. Okay, we'll draw like that. So this is the right side, right side, and this is the left side. Okay, uh, so right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. So let's talk about uh, left congestive heart failure. Okay, so to understand that, we have to think about. Uh, the, uh, the vessels that are connected to the left side. You know what? Uh, I, th I, think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna give you the question first because it defeats the purpose if I, if I explain to you and then I, I ask you to do it because then everybody will get the right answer. So let, let's do the question first and then I will explain, okay? Uh, relaunch the poll. Okay, so again, right, for those of you who missed what I said earlier, on the quiz and test, there will be a few, not a lot, like a few, four or five uh, 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 application questions, okay? So it, it would be something like this. It would seem like we've never talked about it in class, um, and then you will have to apply what you know, okay? So try this first, 
and then I will do the explanation afterwards. Okay, uh, that was two minutes. Let's end the poll, share the results. Um, so let's, let's take a look at this again, right? So as mentioned earlier, this is the heart and then this is the right side and this is the left side. Now, the problem with congestive heart failure, even though we didn't talk about it in the lecture, the question tells you that if it's, it's what happens when it fails to empty its content. Okay, so if it happens on the left side, that means, that means the blood, the blood is going to, uh, you know, pull up here, okay? And, 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 and if the left ventricle is not completely emptying, then that would mean the left atrium is also not completely emptying. And that means when the vessel, the pulmonary vein specifically, is trying to come in, it won't be able to empty all of its blood either. So what that means is the pulmonary veins come from uh, the lungs, right? So if you're not able to empty all of the blood into the uh, left atrium because the left ventricle is like clogged up uh, with fluid, this is kind of like a traffic jam, right? So all that blood is going to end up accumulating in the lungs, okay? So the capillaries in the lungs will now have higher blood pressure uh, than it normally would. So if you think about that BP and the uh, OP um, uh, interaction, now the fluid is being pushed down more than they normally would, and that fluid will accumulate in the lungs. So the correct answer is fluid accumulation in the lungs. Okay, so this is called pulmonary edema. Okay, edema. Okay. What happens if it happens on the right side? Well, if it happens on the right side, it's the same thing. You build up the fluid in the ventricle because you're not emptying, and then you know you're not emptying uh, on the um, right atrium as well. And then now the vena cava, superior and inferior vena cava, will not be able to empty either. So the blood will now be, you know, pooling in the body. But because of gravity, those pooling would be more um, obvious in the lower extremities. Uh, and as a result. If, if this question asks you about the right, uh, right side, right congestive heart failure, then this would be the answer, right CHF. Does that make any sense? Anybody have any question? Okay, so there will be a few questions like these on the test okay, and quiz. Here is another one. Here's another one. Okay, try this one.
Okay. A um, couple more seconds. So to answer this question, you really have to understand the ECG, which is something that we learned about in class. The P, um, the P peak here, the P bump here, that corresponds to atrial contraction, right? Atrial contraction. And then the R peak here is ventricular. Ventricular contraction. Okay, so the 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 lag here is the time it takes for the signal to go from the um, SA note to the AV note, okay? So what happens is for someone with a first degree heart block, and it explains here that the conduction from SA note to AV note is delayed, what changes would you expect? So we would expect the uh, interval between the P and the R to be uh, longer, okay? Because it takes longer for the signal to go from the SA node to the AV node, right? Uh, and that elongation is basically what a heart block is. Okay. Now, um, let's see. So those are the application questions um, that you would expect. Uh, and, and, you know, not all of them will be ones we've talked about, uh, but, but they will not they would not be impossible to do, okay? Like I'm not trying to catch anybody, okay? Uh, it's just that on an online environment, people have access to notes and the internet and so on and so forth. So by introducing a little bit of these application questions, it kind of, you know, balance out some of those advantages that you might have, uh, but it won't be a lot of these questions, just a few. Okay, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's all we're gonna do for today. Um, again, usually we don't go this far long, okay? I know it's tiring to sit here for like three hours in front of the computer. Today is just a little bit long because I spent half an hour talking about the uh, you know, orientation, right? So before you go, I just wanna quickly um, explain very briefly what you have to do uh, for next week before you come to class. Um, you know, just because not everybody was here earlier. Yeah, someone had a question? Go ahead, please. Oh yeah, I missed orientation. What was it about? Yeah, okay. So again, right, I will post this video online afterwards uh, and, and you, can, you can watch that again. But very briefly, for next week, what you want to do is, am I sharing my, my, my screen? Are you guys able to see my browser? I am, right? I am, okay. Just checking. Uh, so you, you want to go to, uh, you know, unit one, lecture two, lecture recordings. And then next one is a little bit long. I do apologize for that because it's uh, confusing stuff, okay? I mean, they are all confusing to be honest. Um, so there are six parts to it. So pace yourself, watch some today, watch some tomorrow, maybe, you know, two parts per day or something like that. Uh, and, and, and you wanna watch all these before coming to the tutorial. So the tutorial for next week will be the same time as today, okay? So no synchronous session on Monday, that's for you to do the, uh, watch the lecture on your own, okay? And then the study guide, you can find it under the study resources, which is right here. So I will post an announcement along with the recording of today, uh, today's thing uh, on eCentennial as soon as it's ready, okay? It takes some time to process the video, okay? But other than that, uh, thank you so much all for coming and staying for the entire time. Uh, I appreciate your patience and attention and I will see you all next week. Okay, feel free to stay behind if you have questions to ask. Uh, and you can always email me, okay? I, uh, I re reply your email super quick. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, feel free to find me. Okay, bye.